The following message is a production of Tony Broom Ministries. God deals with the heathen heart. Now I've already been told, don't tell these people you're talking about me. No, I'm not talking about you. I'm this I'm a I'm amazed with the fact that God deals with the heathen heart. Because we don't like to think of ourselves as heathen, but all of us were in that category once upon a time. The Bible says we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. David said, I was born and shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So we all came from a life of sin. There's really no innocent, well, in a way there is, technically there's innocent little babies, but in one sense they're not. I just hate to have to tell you that, that little innocent baby you're looking at, it's they're just a bunch of sinners. That's what we are. We're born in a world of sin. If you let them grow up long enough, and uh, we'll sin naturally. That's who we are. But I'm glad that God deals with the heathen heart. It doesn't have to wait till you become a Christian to deal with your heart. He dealt, he dealt with our heart a long time before we came to the Lord. And I'm not much of a history bug, but there is uh, some people in here that really like history. And if you read about Bible history, you'll read about God's people Israel. People that He chose, I don't know why He did, I don't know why He chose me either or you, but He chooses who He wants to. And now He chooses whoever will choose Him. How do you know that you're chosen? Well, all you got to do is choose Jesus and you'll know that you're chosen. Because whosoever will may come and drink the water of life freely. But if God's people are seen, Israel, the Jews, are seen coming from the line of Abraham down through David and then on through Jesus, but they're coming out of the land of Egypt, going through the wilderness 40 years. Now they're in the promised land. Now they've sinned against God. And God warns them, speaks to them over and over again. They didn't listen, so they go into captivity. And now they spend 70 years in captivity, just like God said they would in His Word. And at the end of 70 years, just like God said, He brings them out. God will not forget His Word. Oh, did you see me smile when I said that? I couldn't help myself. I just... You know, it's like... Feels better all over more than anywhere else. I mean, God will not forget His Word. It doesn't matter how bad things look around us and how bad things get around us, God is still going to be true to His Word. If God has to deal with the heart of a heathen to get them to do what is in His will and what is in His mind, He will do it. Praise God. I'm glad that it doesn't have to be a preacher. I'm glad that it doesn't have to be a pope or a bishop or somebody with a suit and a tie that God could deal with a servant girl behind the door, that God can deal with a man on the street that nobody pays attention to. God can deal with the heathen heart. Just when the time is right, God speaks to old King Cyrus. And He puts in His heart and He says, those of God's people who are able... Let them go up to Jerusalem and let them begin to build the temple. Well, they go and they start and they have problems and and they're hindered, but they keep on going. And now Ezra, Ezra is a direct, you can read it for yourself. Ezra is a direct descendant from Aaron the priest. And you find this wonderful man of God, Ezra the priest, the scribe. And he begins to seek the Lord God of heaven. You see, things happen when you seek God. I think we ought to make a difference when we can. We ought to be a voice in the community. But there's nothing like seeking God. I mean, you can fill out surveys till your fingers turn green. But unless you seek the face of God, things are not going to change. God can deal with the heathen heart. He doesn't have to have a community vote. There's only one vote, and that's God. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That's the vote you need. He deals with the heathen heart. Let's read some Scripture. Ezra 7, 23-27. And this is spoken by Artaxerxes, old heathen Persian king. Whatsoever is commanded by the God of heaven, let it be diligently done for the house of the God of heaven. Notice how he keeps making reference to the God of heaven. 
a heathen king recognizing the God of heaven. Wow. Oh God. And I know I've stopped in that verse, but I'll I'll just... God, let that be true today. That these heathen government people, sometimes you think they're just an excuse of a resemblance of a human. That's our opinion. They're all precious in God's sight. They have souls. No matter how degraded and depraved they are, they still have souls and God loves them. Jesus died for them. And He can deal with their heart. He recognizes the God of heaven. Let it be diligently done for the house of the God of heaven. For why should there be wrath against the realm of the king and his sons? Also we certify you that touching any of the priests and Levites, singers, porters, nethanim, or ministers of this house of God, it shall not be lawful to impose toll, tribute, or custom upon them. And thou, Ezra, after the wisdom of thy God that is in thine hand, set magistrates and judges which may judge all the people that are beyond the river, all such as know the laws of thy God, and teach ye them that know them not. And whosoever will not do the law of thy God and the law of the king, let judgment be executed speedily upon him, whether it be unto death, or to banishment, or to confiscation of goods, or to imprisonment. Here's the, the killer. Well, it's the liver. Whatever you want to... But it's the text. Blessed be the Lord God of our fathers, which hath put such a thing as this in the king's heart, to beautify the house of the Lord which is in Jerusalem. Blessed be the Lord God of our fathers, which hath put such a thing as this in the king's heart. The Proverbs tell us that the king's heart is in the hands of the Lord as the rivers of water. He turns it wherever He will. Whithersoever He will, the King James says. He turns it like He wants to. God has the heart. Now, He don't have the heart of many that don't serve Him. He He doesn't have their heart in that way. But in the Creator sense way, God has the hearts of every person upon this earth in His hands. He can turn it like a steering wheel of a car. He can turn it like the helm of a ship. He can turn it wherever He wants it to go. You see, God didn't make us robots, but He can still do like your mother used to do when you didn't do right. And some of us live, we were old enough to know they don't do it anymore. But when we were coming up and you didn't do right, Sometimes she'd whip you on the hook of us. But if she couldn't get to that part, she'd grab you by the ear and twist that. God doesn't make everybody serve Him, but He can sure twist your ear. He can pull your hair. He can deal with your heart. God deals with the hearts of the heathen. There are people today in the psalm says... It balances it out. The psalm says otherwise too. It it doesn't contradict what's written here, but it just balances it out. It talks about there are people on this earth right now and the psalmist says God is not in all their thoughts. They don't think about God. They're not worried about God. They don't care about the church. They don't care about the Bible. They don't care about religion. And they don't even like the preacher. God is not in their thoughts. God may not be in their thoughts but they're in His thoughts. God deals with their heart. One preacher describes it like this. Every day, God goes out looking to see who's going to come home to Him. Every day, God is seeking to save the lost. You and I may not be evangelistic every day, but God is a seeking God every day. God deals with the heathen heart every day. The purpose was the rebuilding of the temple. God dealt with this heathen king to put it in his heart to rebuild the temple. And not only did he put it in his heart to do it, there were several kings that came, uh, Cyrus, and it went down to Artaxerxes, and there, there were several kings involved, and God kept it going. And not only did God put it in their heart, but he also led them to foot the bill. 
Now you tell me that God doesn't have things in His control. You see, we think, well, I just don't have the money. It doesn't matter whether you have it and I have it. I know I don't have it and I know you don't have it. But that's not the real deal. God's got it. That's not correct English, but it sure is good preaching. God has it. God has it all in His control. All the silver and the gold in this world is owned by the Lord. He owns it. It's not owned by Rockefeller. It's not owned by the New York Bank and Stock Exchange. It's not owned by Washington, Moscow, or London. The oil, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Iran, all these, they don't own the oil. God owns it. It belongs to God. You don't have to charge me $5 for gas. It belongs to God. Quit gouging me. I'm ticklish. I don't like to be gouged in my ribs. Quit gouging me. There's a purpose. God has a purpose in mind. And God is going to see to it that His work is done. If He has already given the word that all the devils in hell can't prevail against the church, don't you think that God is dealing with the hearts of men and women right now to make sure that His work is going to be done? Jesus Christ Himself, who is the Son of God, God the Son, He told us to pray, Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And He's going to make sure and see to it that that is exactly what's going to happen. Rebuilding the temple. Anything that needs to be done, let it be done speedily. The proclamation. Freedom of God's people. Now this blows my mind too. I just And this is the young folks' word, but I just, I, I just dig this, you know. Sorry. I don't know what the old timers say, Lum and Abner say, we just really like it. We certify you that touching any of the priests and Levites, singers, porters, Nethanim, I had to look up that one. Nethanim is the servants of the Levites and priests. They helped them. They made sure that things got done. We got a lot of Nethanim in church because we can't do it by ourselves. This ministry right here today, the people that you hear in this room, and you hear them praise the Lord a little bit, and we're not praising Him too much. Well, I'm sure we are in our heart, but right now we're kind of grunting and coughing a little bit and rattling papers and doing this and that, and that's all right. But all that that you hear is because of men and women who are net to them, who are servants to the Lord, and making sure the ministry comes about. Ministers of this house of God, it shall not be lawful to impose toll, tribute, or custom upon them. All you got to do, just be a servant of God. Then you don't got to pay no taxes. Ooh, ain't there a good reason to serve God? You want to pay taxes? Wouldn't that be a good thing? I mean, if you can't get them saved to come to church, or you can't even give them a bean supper to bring them into church, and you can't even buy them a steak and get them into church, I'll tell you how you can get them into church so you don't have to pay any taxes. My Georgia McGregor, everybody will come then. Well, isn't this good? There's benefits of being a Christian. Yeah, we have to pay taxes, and the New Testament tells us we should pay taxes, but you know what? In God's sight, the children are free. In God's sight. And we, we, can't, we, we can't bring all that out now. We, we can't bring all that to fruition yet. And we, and we still have to pay taxes, and we're still bound by certain of the laws of the land. But in God's sight, we're free. In God's sight, we don't owe a dime. God had not charged you a dime for anything. Now, I know preachers preach. They even preach to people like, well, if you don't pay your tithes, and you know, we should pay our tithes. But your tithes are not going to buy you five cents in the kingdom of God. Your tithes may open the windows of heaven and He'll pour a blessing out upon you to fulfill the Word of God. But your tithes and your money that you give to missions and your money that you give and make the preacher look good, that's not going to make God bless you anymore. That's not going to make God uh, listen to your prayers anymore. If you don't have a dime to give, God still loves you just as much and He still listens to your prayer just as much. And the amount of money or the denominational currency doesn't do anything to make God love you anymore or less or to make God bless you anymore. God is not bound by a denomination of currency like we are. Does giving to God invoke and ensure blessings? Sure it does. That, that opens a way of blessing. It's a natural law of blessing when you give to the Lord. But you don't have to give anything to God so you can get a blessing. Isn't it amazing how preachers criticize preachers on TV for doing that? And then in our local churches, we turn around and do our people the same way. Duh. 
No, God says you're free. Who the Son sets free is free indeed. A heathen king lets God's people go scot-free, if you will. He lets you go free. You don't have to pay any taxes. No custom or tribute, no toll will be imposed upon you. That's a proclamation. That's a good proclamation. Freedom of God's people. And we see that today kind of opposite. You know, the Scripture says we do not see yet all things subject to Jesus Christ. Even though God has put all things under His feet, we don't see it yet. Hebrews chapter 2, read it. We don't see that yet. In God's mind, in God's heart, in God's ways, in His Word, all things are subject to Christ. But we don't see that yet. As a matter of fact, they're doing everything they can to defame the name of Christ, to put it down, to be derogatory against it. They're doing everything they can not to free God's people, but to put us in bondage. But God's people are free. The freedom of God's people. And the promotion of righteousness and holiness. Now, we're, talk, we're not talking about a full gospel, church of God, or Pentecostal holiness preacher promoting righteousness and holiness, holiness. We're talking about a heathen king whom God is dealing with his heathen heart. And in his heathen heart, somehow, some way, God plants the seed to promote righteousness and holiness. Ezra, you have wisdom. Set magistrates and judges which may help to judge the people. Those that, that know the laws of your God. And those that don't know them, teach them. To teach the law of God and to pay the bill. Well, they're not paying the bill now. They're doing everything they can to discredit the teaching and the furtherance of the gospel. But everything they do to discredit it, God does the opposite to make it happen. You see, when our senior pastor spoke about that seed Sunday morning, you can't stop that seed from growing. That seed doesn't have to have fertilizer. That seed doesn't have to have soil. That seed can grow in the crevice of a rock. That seed can grow on a hillside. You can't stop the seed of God's Word from growing. God plants His Word in the heart of a heathen man and woman. And that seed begins to grow. And that heart, which is heathenistic, begins to take on conditions and take on situations that it's not known before. You see, the heart begins to change. <laughs> God changes the heart. Oh, you can change the re- program. You can change. Uh, you can do all this, and you can change the color of your skin. Even I guess it's possible. You can certainly change the color of your hair. People do it all the time. <laughs> but that's not the real change we need. We need the change of the heart. The heart with the heart, man believes the righteousness, and God can change the heart. He deals with the heathen heart and He deals with a heart to promote righteousness and holiness. Those that don't know the law of God, teach it. Whosoever will not do the law of your God and the law of the King. Now there's only two religions where the law, where government and God are put together. There are only two. One works and one doesn't work. One is true and one is false. The one that works is Israel's religion, if you want to call it that. Israel's God and Israel's government. It works, it will work, it did work, and it will work again. God will bring it to pass. The other is the false church of Revelation chapter 17. The false government of Revelation chapter 18. The Bible calls it, the King James calls it, the one, the world whore. The church, the great whore that sits upon many waters. The one world church, the one world government. The revived Roman Empire that, that will come about. The Roman religion that will come about and be the characteristic of the Antichrist during the tribulation period. It will not work. They'll try to make it work, but it won't work. God's will make sure that God and government will come together again. And it will work. It will work. The Bible proves it will work. Revelation chapter 20, the millennial reign of Christ proves it will work. When God and government come together in righteousness and holiness, it will work. Who will ever will not do the law of the king, the law of your God and the law of king, and all kinds of things could happen to him. Let judgment be executed against him. Whether it be death, banishment, 
It means you just put him on an island. Some of you don't believe in capital punishment. Well, do like the old country song said. Put him down there in the swamp and let the alligator do the rest. <laughs> you ain't got guts enough to put him to death. Put him down there in the swamp and let the Louisiana bayou you take care of him. <laughs> Confiscation of goods. Imprisonment. Blessed be the Lord God of our fathers which has put such a thing as this in the king's heart. God can deal with the heart of Mr. President. He can deal with the heart of the cabinet. He can deal with the heart of the Senate, the House, the legislative bodies. He can deal with the heart judicial system. God can deal with their heart. What about our Sunday school lesson Sunday? Christian, and maybe some of you got up on that divorce and remarriage part in the first part and never did get to the other part, but that was good too, Christian and government. What do we do? Well, we can make a voice in the community and make a difference. And the biggest thing we can do is Second Timothy chapter 2. It's a good rhyme, isn't it? Second Timothy chapter 2 is the best thing we can do. And that is to pray. I will that first of all, prayer, supplications, intercession, giving of thanks be made for all kings and those in authority over us that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. We to pray for them and not be troublemakers ourselves. People would stop being troublemakers. You wouldn't have the law wouldn't have anything to do. Just don't cause no trouble yourself. Be a lead a quiet, peaceable life. Pray. Promote righteousness and holiness. Live for God. Promote holiness. Don't be against it. Promote it. Don't be scared of it. It's not going to grab you. It's not going to hurt you. We need to promote righteousness, holiness. Because there are a lot of things today that are going on in against Christianity, against the body of Christ, against the church, against religion, against the Bible. But God is able to deal with the heathen heart. And He does. We cannot forget even though all these bad things are happening, things are winding up. They're not winding down. They're winding up. They're getting ready. Getting ready for the coming of Jesus Christ. And you and I, your worst days, my friends, they say, well, the worst days may be yet to come. No, my worst days are behind me. <laughs> the best days, the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. Jesus is coming. He will rule and reign this world in righteousness and holiness. He will set us king on David's throne in Jerusalem. Power and glory unto God. All the earth will be filled with the knowledge and glory of God. God is dealing with the hearts of men and women to bring that to pass. God will see to it. The work He has begun will be finished. God which has begun that good work in us will complete it in the day of Jesus Christ. The preceding message has been a production of Tony Broom Ministries. 